to the Greater Washington Region Clean Cities. Glad to glad that everyone uh, could be here today. I want to thank you all for being here. I want to welcome our uh, dynamic uh, group. We're going to talk about biodiesel. Uh, two days from now is National Biodiesel Day, and without uh, for, I do have some announcements, but we'll we'll save those for the end of the meeting because I know we're running a couple of minutes behind. And we'll introduce uh, Jill Hamilton, who is the uh, president CEO of SESI -E uh, Incorporated. They do a lot with clean energy transportation. She runs, helps people get millions and billions of dollars in funding for clean energy, all the different fuels. One of her passions is biodiesel. Uh, but she also uh, helps get grants uh, for other fuels as well. She also serves as the chair of our board of directors. Uh, without further ado, uh, Jill, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Antoine. And I really appreciate you hosting GWRCCC, hosting this. Um, there, you know, we'll have a lot of uh, diesel vehicles for years to come, and we want to see those operating on biodiesel. And we've got a great panel lined up here. Um, I'm going to start with. Colin Heiler, then go to um, Tim Fitzgerald, although I'm not sure if I see Tim on here, so we need to make sure he's here first. And then we'll we'll close with, um, with Paul Winters. So let me begin by introducing Colin Heiler. Um, our first speaker, Colin, and I have, he's the, the CEO of Optimist Technologies, and he and I have known each other for many years and worked together with Tim Fitzgerald, who will be one of our speakers in a moment. Um, but uh, we work together to implement the Optimus B100 vector system, which he will cover today in his discussion. Colin is a veteran of the renewable fuels industry. And prior to coming to Optimus Technology, he was a founder and CEO of Fossil Free Fuel, a renewable energy company, and was the director of research and technology at Steel City Biofuels, a biodiesel program at Penn State. And Colin is a co-inventor on a number of Optimus patents, and holds a BS in mechanical engineering from the University of Pittsburgh. And he's also earned a certificate in entrepreneur leadership from Carnegie Mellon. So welcome, Colin, why don't you kick it off? Awesome, thank you, uh, Jill. And, and thanks to uh, Antoine and, and GWRCCC for, for hosting today. And thanks everybody for, for their time uh, attending the webinar. Um, Antoine, the uh, the screen sharing is currently disabled. If you could if you could uh, configure that, then I'll I'll share slides and, and can jump into it. But um, well uh, while we're while we're working through that, um, yeah, I can I can elaborate a little bit on um, the the overview that that I'll do is is on our technology um, provides uh, the ability to operate on on 100% biodiesel. Um, in in fleet assets, and so um, let's see here. Did that looks like that looks like that did work? Um, uh, again, my name is Colin Heiler. I'm the CEO of Optimus Technologies. We are based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, on the uh, title slide here is is actually a a plow truck from uh, the DC uh, Department of Transportation Operations. Um, they have a wide variety of assets in in use ranging from refuse trucks to um, snow removal vehicles to uh, crane and, and other um, specialty vehicle applications. So uh, let's see here, whoop, that is, uh, let's try this again. There we go. Uh, background on, on biodiesel, for anybody who's not familiar with it, biodiesel is a uh, diesel replacement fuel. It is derived from things like waste fats and agricultural oils. Um, biodiesel, because of the life cycle of the fuel itself, um, has uh, almost zero carbon emissions. Uh, the carbon dioxide that is emitted from the use of biodiesel is what's considered biogenic. Uh, that's in contrast to carbon that's, that's emitted from fossil-based sources, uh, like diesel fuel, which is considered to be anthropogenic. So um, diesel fuel, uh, coal being burned to produce electricity, natural gas being used to, to produce less electricity, those sources of carbon are anthropogenic. They're 
adding to the atmosphere, um, biogenic carbons are uh, being recycled essentially from the atmosphere. In addition to uh, phenomenal reduction in carbon emissions, biodiesel has combustion benefits, performance benefits. Um, it's safer to handle, it's safer for operators to, to service vehicles. And it's also uh, the lowest cost strategy for uh, emission reductions and carbon reductions when we're looking on a, on a fleet basis. High level overview on our technology. Um, what we what we provide is a dual fuel technology. So we're never inhibiting the engine uh, from operating on traditional diesel, uh, but we're enabling the use of 100% biodiesel. We're overcoming some of the traditional challenges the fleet managers have, have faced with biodiesel usage, especially when you get to biodiesel usage at high blends, things like cold flow properties, uh, filter plugging, after treatment compatibility. And so our technology is designed from the ground up to be able to overcome and, uh, and resolve issues that are associated with that. The technology can de be deployed in two ways. Uh, one is retrofitting uh, or upgrading existing assets that are already in the field. So as Jill mentioned, the, the diesel stock that's in the US today, I think there's roughly 15 million uh, medium and heavy duty commercial uh, and, and municipal vehicles that are operating uh, on road today. Um, our technology be, can, can be applied to upgrade those vehicles. It can also be integrated into new vehicle purchases. Um, so uh, we're, we're providing a really flexible solution. Um, and because of the ability to utilize traditional diesel, we provide a bridge in this uh, transportation kind of decarbonization pathway that, that allows fleets to, uh, to segue between uh, current operations today and, and a low carbon future. High level, uh, just provide some component overviews. So we've got a manifold, which includes a filter, heat exchanger, sensors, and, and processing. Um, we are a dual fuel system. So we do have both diesel and biodiesel on board the truck. In some applications, these are dedicated tanks. So uh, photo on the right-hand side, uh, diesel specific tank uh, and a biodiesel specific tank. In some applications, um, there's a, a single tank that has two chambers in it. So both a chamber for biodiesel that's heated and a, and a traditional diesel chamber. Because the volume of, of fuel that's being used is predominantly biodiesel, the biodiesel tanks generally tend to be the larger tank on board the vehicle. Uh, another image of the, of the tank, uh, the biodiesel system does have its own dedicated filter and that eliminates uh, cross-contamination between the diesel system and the biodiesel system. These filters are specific to the engine. So a Volvo engine is going to have a Volvo filter, a Cummins engine is going to have a Cummins filter. Again, these are isolated and separate from the diesel filters, which allows that uh, redundancy of, of operation. The uh, fuel system supplies to the engine. There's a set of valves that are electronically controlled. Uh, these valves switch between the diesel supply side and the biodiesel supply side. Um, from an operator standpoint, the technology is fully automated. So there's nothing an operator needs to do. They're going to get in the vehicle. They're going to operate it as they normally would. Uh, software completely controls the, the process. So the switch between diesel and biodiesel is, is entirely autonomous and, and there's no input or, or engagement that's necessary from the driver or from the operator. In, in vehicle, there is a small display. That display provides information and feedback on the technology. Predominantly, it's utilized as a fuel gauge uh, because we've got two fuel tanks on the vehicle now. The gauge on the dash um, is uh, represents uh, effectively the, the, the diesel volume uh, and, and the new gauge that's installed represents the biodiesel fuel volume. Again, system is fully automated. So even if an operator um, is not, uh, is not, you know, actively paying attention or monitoring this and the biodiesel tank drops below 5%, uh, rather than that vehicle running out of fuel, it'll just automatically seamlessly transition back over to the diesel side. Um, so it's really, uh, it's a real hands-off uh, implementation from, from a fleet operations standpoint. Uh, we've got customers throughout uh, the country and, and even uh, last year have started shipping the product internationally. Um, snow removal operations for Iowa Department of Transportation. We've got uh, fleet operations in uh, both uh, private sector and uh, public sector class eight transportation applications. 
Um, the District of, of Columbia is, is one of the uh, users of the technology in their public works operations, their DDOT uh, snow removal operations and, and otherwise um, across a, a wide variety of, of sectors. Um, many, many municipalities across the country uh, have, have adopted and deployed the technology. And the common theme that we see across most of them is uh, a target or a strategy or a transition to reduce their, their carbon emissions. Um, the equipment that we focus on and the equipment that we're able to, uh, to provide uh, a pathway forward on is, uh, is typically the, the heaviest assets that are very challenging to, to decarbonize or are incredibly expensive uh, from, from an electrification standpoint. Um, I think uh, I saw Rich Iverson is, is, is on the call today. Uh, this is actually a snowplow of, of his operating in, in Ames, Iowa. Uh, he's got a fleet of, of vehicles with the technology on it. Um, and, and one of the things as we look at the, the transition pathway um, is, is that the ability to reduce carbon is, is very, very challenging when we get into large assets like this. And, and when we look at a total life cycle emissions basis, um, utilizing biogenic fuels like biodiesel and renewable diesel um, actually provide a total life cycle emission reduction um, more than what you'd see from, from an electric application. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the energy intensive uh, production of that vehicle and then also uh, the source of those, uh, the electricity that's, that's being utilized to, to power those vehicles. And so we think that there's a really good segment of the market that's that's applicable and, and, and suitable for electric vehicles. Uh, and obviously by powering them with renewable energy, that gets you to a very, a very good reduction in carbon emissions. Uh, but looking more broadly at the fleet, uh, these vehicles are, are diversified. Uh, they, they have very demanding duty cycles. And so uh, looking at decarbonizing in a short term period, we're talking, you know, a few decades, not you know, hundreds of years, um, but but uh, biodiesel provides a, a very strategic pathway for reducing carbon emissions. Uh, you know, Alan, really before you it. jump off that, can I throw in a question here? Is this do you know whether this um, ATRA um, or ATRI study included the cost of of grants in that, or is that just straight up costs without without incentives? For... So, so this is actually this is a hundred percent. This is completely independent of cost. This is just looking at the life cycle of carbon emissions. And so, what what this study okay. did, um, what this study did was look at uh, production. So, manufacturing a diesel vehicle, manufacturing an electric vehicle the operation of that vehicle. So using diesel fuel, using, you know, uh, electricity, using biodiesel, and then the disposal of that asset at the end of life. So the full life cycle emissions of a vehicle, uh, and then quantifying what that carbon uh, impact on the environment is. And so obviously diesel is the, the, the most significant. Um, and then when you look at battery electric, um, you know, you're somewhere in the two and a half million uh, pounds of, of carbon from a life cycle standpoint. And then when you look at a biodiesel asset, uh, you're roughly about a, a million pounds of, of total emitted carbon. And a lot of that is, again, it's production, it's operating the vehicle, and it's disposing of the vehicle. Okay, thank you. Um, and this is my last slide. I'll, I'll close out. Um, we, we just wrapped up uh, at the end of last year, uh, a 1 million mile study on 100% uh, on biodiesel with a commercial partner um, we had 12, uh, 12 entities that, that partnered on this study from private uh, labs, from Clean Fuel Alliance America, um, fleets. Uh, it, it was a, a wide ranging comprehensive study where we monitored five commercial trucks with the Optimus technology operating on B100 and five baseline diesel vehicles. And we saw a lot of uh, really incredible benefits ac across the board. Um, aside from the massive reduction in carbon emissions, um, improvement in the, the diesel particulate filter, uh, improvement in, in actually fuel economy, um, no, no 
change in operations or maintenance. And so uh, this study is available to download from our website or from, from any number of the partners who participated on that. The QR code will take you right to a link there. And, and certainly um, if, if you're exploring biodiesel, uh, there's a, a really great kind of third party verified independent um, validated study on, on some of the benefits that, that can be seen from, from biodiesel operations. Uh, so with that, I will, uh, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Jill. Thanks, Colin. Great, great presentation. Appreciate uh, um, that information. Oh, and ignore my dog. Not much I can do about her whining in the background, so I, I apologize. Um, the next speaker we have is Tim Fitzgerald, uh, and it's been a pleasure to work um, alongside Tim, and uh, you know, who's our next speaker, and for several decades on the Greater Washington Region Clean Cities Coalition, and as one of the best and brightest in D.C., he received a recent promotion to fleet administrator at the District of Columbia's Department of Public Works, leaving his position as fleet management director at DC Water, which I know uh, Collins worked with him in both of those capacities. So um, he has, uh, Tim has been in management for over 30 years, gaining various levels of experience related to fleet management operations, fleet workforce management, fleet technologies, among many, many other wonderful skill sets. Um, and has been recognized in tw uh, 2014 and 2021 um, for the most visionary professional award from the, the Greater Washington Region Clean Cities Coalition. And in 2018, you received the Intelligent Utility Vehicle Award from STEM NASA. And I know you've received as well, Tim, many, many more awards, including one from Clean Fuels um, Alliance America, then National Biodiesel Board. But, He's been invaluable uh, to leadership in the promotion of biodiesel in the Mid-Atlantic region, and he will be talking about his experience with biodiesel and his decision to add B100 to his fleet. Take it from here, Tim. Thanks. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and I'm certainly glad to be with you uh, on this bright day in the city of Washington, D.C. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with many of my colleagues here on this call as well, because uh, you know, these are pioneers in a, in a group of people who have taken thought leaders and their predecessors and others and have thrown their hats in the ring to make this a better uh, environment for those who come after us, uh, those who work with us, and those things that will make it better for everyone to breathe and live and work in better environments. My experience has been in, in biodiesel in, in several. Uh, entities. And I will tell you, first of all, I'm a risk taker. From a fleet management uh, perspective, I love taking the risk to figure out what works best for many of us. Many of my colleagues around the country may not always want to take the risk or pilot money or look in different uh, interests in terms of reducing the greenhouse gases, the GHGs, and then also improving the air quality that uh, is certainly needed in this industry. Um, I've worked with Colin, I've worked with Jill, you know, uh, Mr. Paul Winters I see is on here as well. So, you know, it's, it's a delegate group of professionals and I, I would implore you to tap into the wisdom that is here on this call. The District of Columbia uh, took this on many years ago uh, from, from B20 and B10 and, and other uh, avenues. And we looked around and we said, wait a minute, as the technology gets better, we want to be better. We want to be at the forefront. You know, we don't want to be the tail wagging the dog. We looked at all of this and we made uh, uh, several assessments and we started with uh, uh, Colin and he, and by the way, here's another plug for him. He has a a beautiful facility in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I suggest you go and visit him if you can. Um, when we started embarking upon this, we, we weren't sure what we were going to find. All we knew is, is that we wanted to, to look at better ways to handle fuels. And this is not a one size fits all, many sizes fit many people in many different areas. But I wanna start by telling you that uh, biodiesel is one that needs to be recognized and needs to be utilized in where it best fits your organization and your fleet management. When we started out with this, we didn't know what we were gonna get. 
But since then, we've looked around. We haven't seen any degradation in terms of our vehicles. Um, no clogged filters, no issues in terms of what we heard out there in the public eye and the water cooler talk about, oh, you better be careful, this might happen. I suggest that you take it on, take a look at it, see what works for you, make sure that you investigate, but work with a partner that's gonna make it strong, gonna make it viable and gonna make it useful to you. The, uh, at Public Works, we utilize this. We have a biodiesel tank on the ground. The utilization is up. It has continued to grow over the time frame we've been here. Um, and I'm a little late coming back to this meeting because, of course, I was pulled into another one over alternative fuels as well. So um, uh, my presentation, I couldn't unwrap for you at this particular time. But I want to talk to you guys about the fact that as you're beginning to tune up your fleet and you're beginning to look at these, uh, these, these networks and the diesels and the different types and the variations, get with us, make sure, come visit us, talk to us, talk to your colleagues about what we can do to make it better. Again, we haven't seen degradation. We've seen the usage go up. The operators are loving it. They're knowing what to do with their def tanks, understanding how to operate it. And they're beginning to say, wait a minute, I don't have to smell all of this stuff I've smelled uh, in previous years. And actually I'm going home and I'm breathing. I'm breathing better, I'm feeling better. And you know, and here we have what, what I call an aging workforce. We have a seasoned workforce where the average age is over 50. And we're looking at them and saying, you know, what quality of life will they have after we finish working here? Well, I'm glad to say that a lot of us are feeling better. Uh, it's a healthier air out here. And in terms of this, we look forward to other products that are produced uh, by, by Colin, who's been a great partner, uh, Jill, that's been a, a great partner as well, and other sciences we can look at in terms of making it better. I would say also that you had not only have the biodiesel per se as a fuel, but you also have other products that are being produced with, with, these, uh, with, with these, uh, these liquids. And in terms of this, look at the hydraulics of it all, look at the utilization of it all, spread it across your spectrum. Enhance yourself, take a pilot program on, you know, take the risk because it's worth it and it's meaningful and it'll help you get along in a better uh, sense of where we're headed. Make sure that you, you test it, you look at the test results, you look at what you're doing with it and get your people trained, trained in the utilization of the biodiesel. I'm a star supporter of this and I hope that you all will uh, take, and, take an old guy like me and say, maybe he's talking sense and take me up on that risk. But uh, I look forward to working with you. If you have any questions for me, of course, I can be reached here at DPW as the fleet administrator. Um, again, we have about, uh, what, 100 or so vehicles now on biodiesel. Most of our refuse trucks are using it as well on biodiesel. We're looking to moving it into other venues as well as our dumps and some of the others. Uh, at DC Water, we took some, some practical programs and converted them as well. Uh, in the biodiesel and they're still running well. We started with some older vehicles and guess what? They're still on the road working today. So I look forward to working with you. I hope it uh, makes sense to you and reach out to me if you need some more in-depth information. Thank you for your time. Um, Tim, before we go on to Paul, I have a couple questions for you and then uh, we'll let Paul uh, talk. But um, how has Optimus performed and met your expectations as far as a, a vendor or, or provider of, of services? Well, don't, don't, don't ever tell Colin this, but you know, I'm glad he's not showing his face. He might be smiling. But um, Optimus has worked very well. They've embraced us. They've looked at our fleet, made sure that you know, that the training was there on the ground training on site, which is very important for our operators and our technicians, what to look for. He's been an excellent partner. His team, his crew, they've provided some excellent, been an excellent resource and they've worked well with us 
in all of this and looking forward again to continue work with Colin. Again, don't tell him this. He might start to buy me something or something. I can't <laughs> take gifts, Colin. <laughs> well, you guys have been uh, phenomenal partners and we uh, certainly appreciate your leadership. Thank you, sir. Well, and I look forward to hearing some more of the questions uh, as they come in as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and hand it over to Paul and then we will, um, well, not quite yet, I'm going to introduce him, but then we will uh, get into some more questions. And I have a few for you as well. So Paul Winters is our next speaker and Paul and I have had the pleasure of working together uh, to serve the members of the Clean Fuel Alliance America. And as I mentioned earlier, the former National Biodies Board. And Paul is the Director of Public Affairs and Public Communications for Clean Fuels. He is responsible for leading communication efforts and media outreach on federal policy priorities. Paul brings more than 20 years of extensive experience in media relations and advocacy on the RFS and other federal policies. Paul's earned a bachelor's degree at UCLA and a master's degree at the University of California, Davis in political science and international relations. And we're real happy to have him here with us today. Thank you, Paul. Well, thanks for that kind introduction, Jill. And I'm pleased to be here. If um, I do have some slides I could share if I get the uh, control of the sharing screen. Wonderful. Uh, all right. Um, so I do want to, I appreciate that Jill reminding everyone that uh, we used to be the National Biodiesel Board and now we are the Clean Fuels Alliance America. And the primary reason for that change in name is because of the prevalence now of, of new products in the market. Uh, renewable diesel production, because it's uh, generally being done but through converted uh, petroleum refineries is coming on at very large scale. And now there is as much renewable diesel in the marketplace as there is biodiesel. Both are drop-in fuels. They both uh, displace diesel fuel gallon for gallon and they can be uh, blended together in uh, biodiesel and renewable diesel uh, blends. In California uh, uses a, a, a B20 R80 blend uh, pretty regularly in, in different air, different markets. Uh, sustainable aviation fuel is, is a brand new uh, type of fuel that is coming on strong. The um, Last year, the, the sum total in the U.S. marketplace was 15 million gallons, uh, and uh, that's compared to several billion gallons of biodiesel and renewable diesel. So Colin mentioned some tests that uh, he and his partners are have been doing with uh, with biodiesel and, and outlining some of the fuel quality parameters. Uh, Clean Fuels Alliance and formerly NBB has been working on fuel quality for decades. We launched this BQ9000 program as a biodiesel quality assurance program. Over 90% of the biodiesel produced here in the United States is by BQ9000 members. Uh, there are four types of participants in the program. Those are uh, producers themselves marketers who also are charged with uh, maintaining the spe specs for biodiesel, certified labs, and then retailers. Uh, you heard Colin refer to some of the benefits of using biodiesel that are being studied now, that uh, fuel efficiency one is going to be an important one. The uh, let, um, putting less strain on diesel particulate filters and um, overall performance of, of the engines. Those all come with increasing fuel quality. You heard from Tim uh, about the um, concerns he heard early on and that have been overcome. Part of those are with, uh, with um, 
storage and the life cycle of maintaining your, your biodiesel. Uh, this has been studied by NREL, and they found that with, with B20 meeting ASTM specifications in the US market today on a consistent basis, that essentially there's a, a shelf life of a year for biodiesel produced here in the United States. And with monitoring and the additization that can extend the shelf life to four years. So NREL has been studying the results of our BQ 9000 program since 2017. They, they do annual studies. And what they are finding is that um, most of the biodiesel on the market today is meeting number one specs for, for the fuel. So where um, most diesel in the market is number two diesel, uh, the biodiesel is meeting a number one spec. So where are we today? Oh, well, before you jump off that slide, I'm gonna throw in a question here. Sorry about that. Sure. I'm gonna interrupt you, but um, I understand there are new ASTM specifications as well on metals that will help with aftermarket um, systems, aftermarket uh, catalysts and whatnot. Um, I don't know if you can speak to that, but I did think it was worth mentioning. Yeah, and the, the gist here is that ASTM has been monitoring this, this quality assurance program and what they have decided as a group, and I'm sure everyone knows ASTM brings together fuel producers and, and engine manufacturers to discuss these specifications. Uh, but because biodiesel is meeting the highest quality standards on a consistent basis, uh, ASTM will lower the metal specifications for the fuel, um, I think 10 times uh, by a factor of 10% of, um, of what they, they are today. So um, it's just another measure of how much progress has been made on the quality assurance front for biodiesel. Thank you, Jill. Um, so a couple of years ago, Clean Fuels set a vision for our industry to grow to 6 billion gallons by the end of this decade. And that is for US produced bio diesel and renewable diesel. Uh, today, we are at 5% uh, of the on-road diesel market. It's 3.7 billion gallons that were made available here in the United States um, last year, 3 billion of that was produced here in the United States. And we are 